Our last keynote speaker in the morning session uh, entitled Deeply Innovative Cyber Universities Looking to the Future by Associate Professor Eugene Coach, University of Calgary, Canada, President-elect AECT. Dr. Eugene Coach enjoyed his youth in Canada's rural northern communities after graduating from a civil engineering program in 1981, he moved to Regina as the senior Sakenchevan oil and gas petrophysicist until he was invited in 1986 to join Unico Chevron Canada's head offices in Calgary, Alberta. There he decided to build and lead lead international interdisciplinary corporate mega project exploration, development and production mergers and acquisitions. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Eugene Coach. Greetings, everyone. So while I clap, sorry, and bienvenue, and greetings from Canada, where I come from. We are a little bit behind in time, so I will, uh, I will go a little bit quickly. The slides that I have here, you can contact me, and I will send them to you, if you like, or get a hold of TCU. We've heard from Dr. Downs about transformation. How many of you are in the higher education system, a professor or a student? Professors, instructors, students. I know you students back there. I forget the university you're from. But how many are in government and leadership? How many of you are involved in setting up or running educational technology-based leadership pro uh, learning programs in some way. Does it interest you still? From what we're hearing today, it's very interesting. So there's a lot on this slide. I'm going to go through fairly quickly. I introduce myself. This is, these are the ways you can get hold of me on social media. I understand because of TCU's amazing work, this is streamed on Facebook right now. I am presently teaching two classes uh, with students around the world from India to Mexico to Dubai. Where's the camera? Is that the one? And you guys are going to hear answers to your final project if you're watching. <laughs> I've already heard on Twitter that it's in too many time zones, but my students are watching today. So greetings from around the world, and we're going to go fairly quickly. I'm going to talk about what it's going to take to transform education. That minister's speech on uh, transformation on smart Thailand is cutting-edge thinking. I travel the world speaking and learning with systems that develop e-learning and other ways of learning, and I'm hearing language here that I, knew, uh, is, that I know is cutting-edge. That's the city I'm from. Whoa, that's, that's, that's the city in the summer, and that's it in the winter, and it can be cold in Canada. So we are a very big country, and we developed our online learning a while back. Twelve years ago, I was hired at my university to build programs and design them and teach in them, and, uh, and they've exploded. Uh, we have students all over the world. I'll tell you about that in a bit. I suspect the same thing will happen to you. How many of you would like a promotion? Huh? A promotion? Move up in the ladder? Well, I just asked the board at AECT, what's the number one thing to tell people in Thailand with this interesting new smart Thailand innovation? And they said, tell all the people that are in educational leadership, they'll be leaders, uh, educational technology, they'll be leaders of some sort before too long. Because this is taking the world by storm. It isn't just talk. I'm going to tell you how to build your system up and lead it forward. So that's my discussion. Long trip here. <laughs> my experience has been uh, uh, two careers. Uh, first, I made a lot of money and with Unical Chevron. Ma managing mega projects and developing things around the world here in Thailand, actually, with one of my portfolios. And then I uh, went, decided to make a difference. I really did. 
and became a teacher. But they saw I had technology experience, I was an engineer, and they said, you know, you can use what you know to help, help the world. So I thought, I'll become a university professor, which I did. I was a superintendent of schools, and now uh, a professor of learning technologies. I, design learning and I teach how to design learning environments with technology. I also teach in leadership. I have two specialties, two PhD specialties. Um, and design the world for learning with technology and design a better world for leading it and policy and, and leadership systems. So leadership, organization, and learning go together in this new world that you're going to lead and get promotions because of. So I'm also president-elect of AECT, which is the largest and oldest. It's a 100-year-old professional association where the inventors of the theories for technology-informed learning come from. I just came from Chicago on the weekend. They bring you, the board brings greetings to Thailand. And um, we are 2,500 people in the organization in 13 countries with 9,000 9, affiliate members. And uh, we are growing in size very quickly. So I'm going to talk about building up systems that are truly transforming and how you can watch for the innovation that's going to change your system, even if it's the tiniest idea. So let's go. My own practice has been all over the world. I've been working in these countries, going to Greece in the fall to talk about educational technology, where they have a similar program as the minister. But I think you all, uh, their, their World Bank and IMF funded, you all have some very other financial approaches, which is very interesting. And the MOOCs that you've started and the way you've started with TCU are, according to my board, uh, some of the most clever, clean approaches to bringing education to everyone that we've seen uh, in the world. So it's truly an honor to be here. And I'm going to be talking to you about that kind of level of work. I've worked with the Vatican, looking at the transfer of power and leadership through technology around the world. And I'm not even Catholic. Uh, and I worked with Hawaii to resurrect their uh, Iliani school state system uh, with technology enhanced learning with Spain, Australia, and uh, Mexico most recently, and now to Greece. And I'm seeing a common theme, but I have heard things here today from your minister that I, they told me I would hear, and I've heard them from TCU. They're truly unique. And it, you're starting kind of fresh with a new idea that you've been working at for a while with MOOCs, these wonderful MOOCs, that are probably going to bring you markets and opportunities and grow your systems. I know in the case of my university, I work in a university of 40,000 people, students, uh, 10,000 students online, and my faculty has just about 2,000 online students in every degree program. It's a research, major research university. Um, and I think you're going to be in the same boat in a few years if you take the lead. So we'll talk about that. These are the areas of expertise that I have. In particular, uh, we're going to talk about designing alternative systems to the ones that we have or creating alternative systems within ones we do have. So these are my uh, academic research areas. I research and teach in this stuff too, as well as lead AECT forward. So we're going to talk about the blue areas today mostly. So we're going to talk about the trends, student mobility. You know, you've heard this already, so I'll go quickly through that. And then how do you create an adaptable e-university? One of the great things that you know from technology is it changes rapidly. You'll be hearing with, from Intel and Microsoft later. It changes all the time. And leadership gets to say a lot, you know, it changes so fast we can't make a plan. But what we've learned is you can work with changing technology and changing resources, as Dr. Hanley said. You can keep the stuff coming in the door, the useful materials that he's building, magic. You can keep uh, building programs, but can you sustain them? And I work a lot with places with e-learning. The biggest problem is sustainable innovation. So once you get the idea and you get the program and you get the student market, can you maintain it? Uh, if I had another life to live, I would start out uh, probably with uh, creating a, a cyber university because I think, I do believe, they will sweep the world beyond any example you've ever seen if they have a good start. And all the DNA of a fresh start without making all the mistakes of the previous learning systems are in that speech you heard this morning. I'm just so, so honored to, to add on to that. So we're going to talk about what does it mean to be adaptable? How do I set up a program, a department, a university, a system statewide that's going to be adaptable enough? And we have principles and examples. I'll bring you the research and show you some of that stuff. 
It's about distributed network leadership and not just using network as a convenient term of, you know, connecting dots and friendships and it's not that kind of network. This is the organ we're going to show you the university of the future that's already here that ha is n more networked than it is vertically structured, more connectable, more adaptable. When you can plug in the learning resources Dr. Hanley talked about to a design that is a as different as every one of you in here, and as different as all your programs, deliver it online in different ways, or blend it, even better, that's what my school does, is blend it. You're going to come up with new ways of, of creating universities, and uh, then I'm gonna talk about what do you watch for? What makes it different? Since you're, at the, since you're starting with the Smart, Smart Thailand project, how do you make an organization truly innovative? And I mean the way Stephen uh, Downs was talking, truly deeply innovative, where the process and the product of what is done changes. And I'm gonna show you some examples of that. Okay, so here we go. So increased student mobility. Enrollment pattern changes are in the world, enrollment patterns are changing in the world. We are trying to go for completion, not just access and engagement. This is coming from the, the latest UNESCO report. They haven't done one in a while, but I'll show you a newer one, same thing, same trends. Completion, not just access, diversity's up. Privatization and alternative business models are up, way up. Funding shifts are huge and changing. Increasing connectivity through technology is absolutely critical. And quality concerns are coming right behind. So there, there's a concern that the quality of online programs or blended programs may not be what it could be. And as I'll show you, and as my friend David Merrill, Charlie Rigeluth told me before I left, they said, you remind them that good design and good teaching are good design and good teaching. And nothing else is more important. So it's like, okay, I know you're good teachers and you do design. That's underneath what I'm talking about, the university of the future that's flexible. And there's a struggle for the soul of higher education. I have colleagues that are, belong to the Ivy Leaf schools and I represent 900 universities as coming president of ACT. And I assure you there are every imaginable perspective on the integrity of higher education, the integrity of it. I also assure you that through the research I've done and the work my colleagues are doing, with good design and good practice that we've had a hundred years of, of people studying this stuff, we can guarantee the quality. It's the sustainability that's becoming an issue, and that's why I switched into the leadership faculty, to help our best people, you, become leaders of a new way of educating. Here's some ideas. So on enrollment changes, India and China, China dominate. I've talked to some of you here. You've already got that information. A different learner set is coming into online learning and, and they're traveling across borders by digital spaces and they are non-traditional, older people and people who traditionally have not had the means to access education. This is really important and it's a new market that the big old schools really haven't captured. They're, they've got their markets, they're good. Some of the new e-universities and cyber universities, TCU, are connecting universities together to build that capacity to give the world access. And not just the local world, but also the, the state and states around you. So let's take a look at the world. The student flows from China to the USA per year in higher education are 260,000 students uh, flowing to the United States out of 700,000 students, these are higher ed students, every year from China. And the arrows on that graph, this comes from the UNESCO's Online, uh, online visualization, visualization database, and you will see that not many are coming to Thailand yet, but they will come. <laughs> They're coming to Canada in bigger numbers than we expected. Our biggest challenge in online learning and university is to get more people in faster and keep the quality up. We are oversubscribed by a factor of five. For every one person in our programs, 15 don't get in. We want to change that number, and these are wow, the screening in my universities heavy duty. So even with that, the market is more than we ever dreamed. Just like Stephen said, they expected 20, they had 200,000. We expected 20, we have 2,000, and we're growing. We, we cannot grow the institution fast enough to provide the online degrees that are required. And those are high-end degrees, so we're, I'm talking as well about everything else, certification, skill set, information, our community colleges, everybody's gearing up for that. So look at that market from China that could could be part of your e-system in Thailand. Look at India, the second largest student exporter. 970,000 people out of 182,000 go to the USA. 
I use the USA as an example because it's attracting most, USA is uh, attracting most of the foreign students from around the world to the education systems. But they're not doing it all via distance. And there's a huge market opening up, as we're talking, for distance inclusion. So that's pretty surprising. Think about that in Thailand's case. So we're trying to provide completion and access in these systems. Diversification in the system. Our old systems, like the one on the left, we build systems up that are mechanical, that are very efficient, and they get things done. You heard Stephen talk about efficiency. They get things done, that factory model on the left. What do we need when we need better? I have a student at Daimler Mercedes in Stuttgart. She's an instructional designer. She says, what we do at Mercedes is we add specialization. They're adding for the driverless car. They're adding for, you know, in some years, Mercedes will not run into each other on the highway. They will refuse to run into each other. They know from the satellites not to. Those things are in the cars now, they're not turned on. We just keep adding specializations. We're doing that in education right now. My university, the big universities that are members of AECT, all 900 universities, we certify many of those programs. Uh, they're adding complexity with every new technology rollout and pedagogical new, new idea. But you know, you can't keep doing that forever. It's expensive. So there are innovative ways of adding scale without adding complexity. And they are on the right by looking at patterns and flows and big data and analytics, we are understanding that we can make contributions to the way we deliver, design and deliver education, especially with e-learning, to involve the whole world. So you're gonna see those principles for the rest of the talk. Funding shortages and cost increases are changing education radically. You're gonna see the word partnership over and over and over again. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing older systems being uncomfortable with the new public-private partnerships that are on the deck. But to do this kind of work in that ocean of opportunity, you're going to need partners. You can't build it all yourself. You can't run it all yourself. And the TCU guys were talking to me last night, and they were explaining how they connect people with the ability to build and, and put together pilots and try things and use information. You are so lucky you don't have great big systems showing you the example of what should be because they're out of date in five years, and they're too big to sustain themselves, some of them. You're starting kind of fresh, very exciting. So without deep innovation, that stuff is unsustainable. New technologies are distributing things better. But not everybody knows that. When the bricks and mortar, the, the shift from bricks and mortar institutions, very expensive model, to online, very expensive development model, and then it gets a lot less expensive, that's going to make things more noticeable. And we're going to see countries in your area, neighbors to you, competing for this sort of possibility. And I'm so excited for you with your Smart Thailand plan because it fits perfectly everything I've been studying that says you need these parameters. I'm going to show you what that might look like. Quality concerns, again, I've talked about those. AECT has a quality recognition program. We used to certify all the universities and fund all the educational technology degree program granting universities and high schools in the United States. It's a very United States organization. I am the first president ever to be from a non-US country, from Canada. That's a really big deal for this organization as it becomes global. And uh, we've got recognition programs that we, could, we can help you with to, uh, based on really deep, deep standards, research proven, to simply accredit or qualify your programs should you want. You can work with us. I had to pitch AECT there, that's what they make me do this, so. Okay, so, oh, there's a struggle, but, ah, lots of struggles in education. Let's talk about strategic technology report, just came out. There's 10 strategic technologies that they want us to be thinking about right now. This is the EduCause, one of the big, uh, who's familiar with EduCause? Little bit, very, very good resource on higher education and learning, especially with technology. They're the kind of change gurus in the United States and Europe. So uh, mobile devices are big. Software as a service, performance analytics, the machines will be watching everything we do and help us do it better. Access to online, learning management softwares that are online. Mobile apps for enterprise apps, desktop tools and learning analytics again. Learning analytics because as Steven said that the computers are going to be able very soon to help learners pick content, attain their goals, be measured for those goals and move on. Think of the AI systems as intelligent systems way behind the tutor, way ahead of what we were talking about for tutoring. Read Dr. Charlie Rigelius' uh, work on this. Uh, he's talking about intelligent support systems for per participative 
flexible learning environments that are truly student-led, where parents and students in schools, and where uh, adult learners set their own pace and time. Changing the industrial model from sorting into time, content into time blocks, into a self-directed nonlinear model. Okay, so that's all the good stuff. Let's take a look now at the, oops, big issue, formal versus informal learning. The EU is piloting a lot of this. How do we slice the, the pie between formal and informal learning? How do, how do we build informal learning creditable systems? That's a challenge. Here are some examples. EU's the best example we found in our global of the 13 country scan we did, the trailer uh, project out of Spain. You can research that. And they are starting to use I ad advanced LMSs to help students guide their own progress and their own content attainment, their skill attainments. So there's competing models. MOOCs were at the forefront years ago. They still are. But all this other stuff is coming in. So we need to carefully evaluate the models as they grow. And that's exactly what I've been hearing here today. There are different ways of understanding design when it comes to online learning. And you're right at the cusp of those different understandings here. Ah, that's just a model from the old way on the left behavioral systems all the way over to the right system where students in a more subjective world are guiding their programming and their achievements and their lives. Most of my students in my online programs are senior leaders in universities or in colleges or in school systems. They have full-time jobs and yet they are doing a full thesis-based 12 credit program degree and they're succeeding wildly as professors and, and as as leaders in systems. So we're teaching all the way over here on this subjective side where they get to pick some of their content and their pacing and we support them all the way with the online part. But good design is good design. This from David Merrill, the best design principles that we found in association, as the association of design colleagues are engaged learners and real world problem solving. So if you're designing an environment that's headed in the MOOC way in the online e-learning world, problem solving, activation of existing knowledge, demonstrate that knowledge, and apply that knowledge. It's really that simple. Oops. And then you have to integrate the knowledge. So those are the principles, basic principles from, from David Merrill of a, a study of 100 years of our design work. That's kind of what's working, face to face or not. So what's the adaptable university of the future look like? have a look at what the research says. First it says we have to look at university differently. Now I can hear the conversations, I walked around and talked to a few of you of the old university model which is 400 years old, I've lived in them, worked with them, studied them, and the new one which is like your TCU and other innovations like this around the world. So we have to see, see it with new eyes. Works different, we no longer produce single goods in single locations. We, we share things as networks around the world. My student at Mercedes works with a design team around the world. They seldom meet face to face. Most of the big firms that I work with are in the same boat. Most of the universities I work with and governments are in the same boat. They're sharing things in different parts of the world through technology. We're less and less meeting each other face to face. And we used to think, oh, that's not the education. That's not the private model. But in a well-designed classroom, personal relations with the teacher work. In a well-designed university online system, the same thing matters. It's about connections and relationships. And I'm going to show you the patterns and the kinds of network relationships that are very healthy for these kinds of innovations. So we're inter interconnected. We're very codependent to, on each other around the world. And we're technologi technologically enabled. But these partnerships and distributed networks matter. And my whole world of research is studying how these networks actually work and what, which ones fail and which ones succeed. I'm going to share those, some of those results with you now. So we're trying to get beyond the old university structures and hierarchies and public and private and all this and just understand what's it going to take to get the most people with the best lives and futures coming out of our systems or being part of our systems, whether they're public, private, or whatever, anywhere on Earth. I have students from nine time zones in my summer course. And if you're listening, students, <laughs> the ones in the wrong time zone, I'm sorry. But uh, we know that we bring different things to the table. We have to appreciate those differences. Even in terms of language, we're starting to learn as big systems that we're going to have to find a way to design for local languages and local systems. 
using these principles. These are very English principles, and they're not translating well into other cultures. We need to learn as much as, as in our design, it involves learning. So that's what we're teaching in our design classes. And Alma Harris says, same thing for leadership. We need to redefine these boundaries a little bit so we can get this work done, or the innovation can't take off, and it dies. Or some private outfit will take it over and give back to you for twice the price. E-learning organizations have to move from inflexible to flexible. On the right, you see a flock of birds. You ever notice birds do not run into buildings as flocks, yet they're fast. Fl schools of fish, same thing. This is big data talking now and the people from our IT area, but this is how they're designing. This is how Google designs, how they manage traffic in their servers. They use the, the models on the right. Flu simple principles that help massive systems change very, very quickly. And that's kind of what we're seeing in higher education and in online learning, is we're going to have to be that kind of flexible on the right. And that model on the left, it just it doesn't work. It's too brittle. I'll show you why. So leadership thinking has changed. This, all through these fancy titles over the last 100 years, now it's about transformation and distribution. But I study these things around the world. I don't see transformation, and I don't see distribution. I see the language of it. But I see us doing old things with new labels in many, many systems, especially where there's technology. I'm going to talk to you about a very deep, deep level of innovation that will cut through a lot of this language for you. So leadership thinking is trending from transaction, what we do with each other, to transformation, to the change Stephen Downs talked about, from structural procedures that we have to have. I mean, these, our systems work, are huge bureaucracies in education. But we all know the good, the good guys, the innovators, work between the bureaucratic layers and across and above them at all moments in, all time, in time. You, you do what you have to do, and then you write it down the way you have to. Now we're starting to think, let's build things that way. Let's design them that way so the system learns with what, the, what matters to people learning, matters to people lear leading, matters, matters to funding, funders, and matters to governments at the same time, all at once, instead of this department, university, ch -ch -ch. and as I, I scan the world, I'm finding more and more of the stuff on the right-hand side. So we need to be complex, adaptive, partnered systems that understand, like you're not going to change the bureaucracy that's thousands of years old in education, but for pilots like e-learning, we're finding these kinds of concepts work and provide agility within the larger system. Larger systems can't do this stuff, but actually they are, they are. Some of our government systems that I've seen uh, they're trying to achieve the stuff on the right exclusively. So, we learn this from nature. By studying nature, this is the complexity theorist, guys. Not chaos, but complexity. So, organization. The structure of the, of the organization that we work in, your university, your department, we're trending from bureaucratic to more relational. From vertically, vertical power to distributed power, where you share a little bit of authority so people get things done faster. I study this stuff empirically. <laughs> I can, I'm giving you some evidence here. This is not just fancy metaphor talk. This stuff can actually be mapped now, and we can start to almost predict the kinds of patterns that are capable of innovation and emergence with, say, statewide EMOOC pro programs or whatever comes next. I'm going to show you some of that in a bit. So it's thinking from the left to the right. Pyramid, strong, hierarchical, not very flexible that thing on the right, that's an actual research uh, project. I'll show you about that in a bit. Change thinking's changing. <laughs> we're, we teach it now and we're learning that from acting on a closed system, we're now acting within open systems and creating them. And we mean that. The, the MOOCs in Thailand are an example. They're open systems, subject to all the changes and efforts. So on the left, we saw linear cause and effect as a design. In a steady state, we're always trying to be steady state. The only steady state ecosystem in the world is a dead system. So we're trying to model our organizations on the right, for on the right, generative, nonlinear, simultaneously growing systems filled with complications, but general patterns of development. Our instructional design, our organizational design thinking is headed that way too. Innovation thinking has changed from that standard S curve business. You know, we early adopters, stable adoption then diffusion, that was a business model, as Stephen hinted, into something different. We're a, sh a shared value proposition. The learner says, is this worth it to me? Can I afford this? Will I get something of this? Will I stay with this? These are the things that are keeping people engaged. Same thing with faculty, Gen Y faculty. They want a happy life. They want to make a difference in the world. I have students right now that come to me, Dr. Couch, 
I just got my PhD. I want to make a difference. Well, what do you want to do? I want to make a difference. I was like, okay, <laughs> what about the money thing? You know, well, money thing isn't as big as making a difference. So we have to design programs that will create those people, sustain them, and then keep them informed in the profession over their life. And that means we change. We change it from being a person who goes to university and sort of knows everything and does PD to a person who may weave in and out of learning environments that are online for the rest of their lives. And we're already seeing interest in that, enormous interest. So an organization is just a mental model. You can't really see one. I'm trying to play with your idea of what an organization is. You're so ingrained right now with the bureaucratic model, not just you, everyone, it, my, me too. It's hard to think this new way, and yet we know that the way on the right is the way we operate. So what is a networked organization structure? It's the stuff on the right, where everything's interconnected, describable, predictable somewhat, but not a vertical power dimension only. There's the vertical power, but that stuff on the right is what we're going for. That's how Amazon's built, that's how Google operates, that's how NASA and the NSA I work with, they, that's how they operate. Networked organizations. That's how some of the most terrifying terrorist organizations work on the world. They're networks, they're not vertical structures, and that's why they're so incredibly effective in what they do, as, as sad as that can be. Typical university organizations on the left, specialization's important, most brittle thing. Change one line, breaks. Add new boxes, problems. On the right is a tree upside down. That's how nature likes to grow, as it needs to grow, with fractals we're using to model organization growth. Different mindsets. Bureaucracies, that's mine in my university, probably looks the same in university. There's a provost and everybody else. It's the least adaptable organization as an organization. Should an innovation occur and you have to find something new and make it happen everywhere and keep everybody happy and make people live better, this is tough. There's huge pressures in HR management. We're teaching this now, network theory again, showing people how they can plan for disruption. This theme of your conference, disruptive ed education, we're going to talk about that a little bit. And as Stephen said, we're moving beyond disruptive education now. We're moving beyond disruption into something else. More transformative, but really more emergent. It's changed from what it was to what it is, and the, the butterfly metaphor, from caterpillar to butterfly. That's not change. That's an evolution. That's the kind of disruption we're talking about now that, as transformation. So we have different ways of modeling things, but we can't describe them to people. I'm finding in my own research. I work with the Weather Network in Canada. <laughs> it's a TV big TV network, and they show the weather. And they, this is how people like to see their weather, kind of, with little blue blobs and rain coming and storms. They like that. But we can show things in 3D now, same data, and we piloted this, and we, we tried to study. We said, do people want to see their weather like this? Because if we show your city, you can kind of see what weather's red and dark and tornadic activity and what's rainy and cold. We can do this, but people didn't want to see that. They weren't ready. They like to see this flat business. That's what they're ready to see. Same thing in organizations. We're not ready yet to see this stuff, but that's how we're thinking about them. That's how we're thinking about how the in one part changes all the other parts. Here's an example. This was a study done on an entire statewide system where we put centralized servers into one huge organization in education, the biggest one, and the government wanted to pilot that that central service creation with the uptake in the rural areas. And this is, what, this is how we described what actually happened. I'll tell you more about that in a bit. Are there examples of, do organizations look like that? It's a mindset. Yes, they do, but they'll show you a flow chart every time. And then they'll say, this is who you've got to talk to, and this is how it really works, and this is who we sort of pay extra to, and you know, it's all that. And we've lived that, we're good at that. Good leaders are really good at that. But this is trying to, uh, so we can teach new leaders that there's more than just the, that other structural system. Here are the examples we use. Work with the US Air Force on triage and emergency work around the world. And they use these kinds of organizations. They have to be fast, quick, adaptable for the local area. They have to get in, do the right thing, not the wrong thing, and get out. And then they change. That's the other thing about these kinds of organizations. They're not forever. As you know, it, it changes with the technology and the market. So we have to be flexible, really flexible. And these outfits are, they are, and they're the models we're sort of using and studying. 
So what's a complex organization? What is all that fancy talk? Well, it's an instrument that encompasses everything and is yet like a household or a community. It's a system we understand. Okay. These are ecosystems, each one of them. And you know, I just did a family reunion. How many of you have planned a family reunion? That's when people in my country, when people get together, your family comes together. And sure enough, one aunt will say, we're having chicken. And my chicken. You know, and it's like, oh, I love you, aunt, but you know, we can't possibly get that much chicken and, the, and cook your way. And she's, and it's my chicken or no, no, no way. And it's like, I'm not coming. And it's like, okay. So families give us models for these kind of fluid systems that we're used to working with. Yet, our bureaucracies don't work that way. Somewhere in between the family and the bureaucracy is a system that sees an innovation, works together with the people to serve, gets it done, and then maybe changes a little bit. That's what we're talking about here. So what's an e-university e e ecosystem? It's going to be a bunch of subsystems working together. We use the computers for this stuff now, the big data and the analytics, to put together all the complicated changing parts. That's the IT engineer's problem. I'm an engineer. <laughs> I know what we used to have to do. You tell them to give you the information and describe what's happening in a complex world of enrollment and, and, and financial changes and tax problems and, and all the things shaping your work. Put it all together, design decent learning, interactive, student-based, self-directed with an AI background, e-learning, MOOC-based for at the beginning. We're finding a big study coming out soon, one on Thailand actually, is going to say that e-learning is an on-ramp into education. It's an invitation. It's a Trojan horse for e-learning and for all sorts of thinking by people who aren't used to learning in higher education systems. It's an opportunity. So it's an ecosystem we're looking at. This is the ways we map them. Middle one's the best ecosystem. You, on the left, you have a, the king and his men. That's the hierarchical one. To get from one node to the other, you have to go through that central person. You ever worked in a place like that? I have. Universities are really good at that. You can't get anything without going through the dean. On the middle, you have clusters of people, like departments in universities. And there's certain important people. You can design these environments. You can build these networks and these relationships so that people are connected. And you can take out one or two nodes, clusters, and replace them with a different kind. Say you need a different expertise, a different type of relationship, maybe more technical, maybe less technical. This, that one's incompressible. It's, it's tough, decentralized. That's why you're hearing all this decentralized leadership, sharing authority, putting it out to the divisions, bringing it back. I used to run a company. Well, part of a company that was worldwide. We had divisions in every country. We had some, we had a lot of that middle distributed network. We didn't know it then, though. We still drew a flow chart when we showed people what the company was. But now engineering our, our thinking our architect, designing our learning environments this way, and our university systems to support them for e-learning, that's, that's new thinking. The one on the right is too distributive. It's everybody's connected to everything. And when one change happens in one place, everything ripples through and changes. You have, do you have cascading power failures here, sometimes when the whole power grid goes down for a city? See, you're, you're ahead of us. But now and then, in the US and Canada, we get a, a cascading failure where one computer will cause a problem and trip all the other computers, and all the power goes out for like hundreds and hundreds, millions of people. It happens a couple times every 10 years. That's, a, that's too distributive a system. You don't want to have one thing change everything. OK. So what kind of people work in networked organizations? You, your kind of people. All these sorts of people work together. How we connect them in these structures is up to us. We're not thinking of using these as descriptive as much as we are as design models now. So when I ask people, how did you set yourself up in that central service, centrally served environment? By the way, the servers we built for that, we had an engineering study and a teaching and learning study. The engineering study, that's Citrix go-to meeting right now. We had actually helicopters flying in computers for the government from New York, and they were new. And uh, even though this pilot didn't work because the educators weren't nimble enough to pick it up and make it work, uh, Google um, Citrix went and developed it into a major business. So it was technical success, but actually it didn't work so well for the teachers. And that's why the government had me there. How do you design without our intervention? We give them the money, we give them the idea. We want to see how they actually lead, how they actually lead themselves forward without ties. This is how they describe themselves. 
They created two chairs between two systems and just d doubled everything else. That's not really a network. And it didn't work. They couldn't work together. This is how they actually worked. This is using this theory now. So they formed two huge clusters. The blue cluster in the middle was the project manager, an IT person, believe it or not, who didn't speak the language of education and pedagogy, but connected everyone by an, as an information hub. All those red links are bureaucratic. Everyone reported to him, but they didn't like him. <laughs> and he didn't share their knowledge. So we re-engineered that position in the next project. So that was not based on red links, which are bureaucratic, but more on knowledge links, which are blue, and collegial links, which are green. So we created different kinds of relationships. The teachers and the instructors in the system were on the outside edge. They weren't part of the center. And they weren't, they, they, the first day the system went down, and it went down because children were streaming live music and YouTube. <laughs> Didn't tell the teacher. It brought the system down. The first day the system went down, the teachers left the room, said, we're not doing this pilot anymore. And the innovation died right there. And this network thing showed that what was on the left was no way to describe what really happened. But on the right, we actually mapped over time how things grew and fell apart. So we understand from many studies, I've got 5,000 people now in studies like this, we're understanding how to predict sort of an, a circulatory system for innovation. So there's four steps to creating that kind of team. Here's something you can take away. Take a picture of this screen when you're done. You can build up their network capacity, their, their network teams, their innovation ability, and their ability to lead change. And there's new policy models coming to help support these kinds of flexible organizations. So that's their study on that. They have to be diverse. Don't read this. It just means you have to speak enough common language with somebody else to work with them in a different discipline, different university, different sector. And you need to be diverse in terms of the, the specialization. So you can't have all engineers building a learning program. You can't have all learning program people build it. You can't have all leadership people build it. You need a mix. And they need to share what they know. Or they're going to create something that doesn't, isn't flexible. That's what we're finding. So what are the features of these really highly capable, flexible organizations when we find them? Well, they all have seven characteristics. Each person, each node, each dot, has most of these characteristics when they're flexible. A clear, they know what they're supposed to do in the system. And it might not be a functional role, like a job description, like Dean. It might be, I'm here to make this thing go so far with this skill set. And then they may leave, and another person may come in. They have a value system. In education, it's usually a professional duty of care. They generate information internally when they can't find an answer. Somehow, among them, they will find the people to get the answers. They won't expect an, answers from a, an answer from a certain group. Number six, oh, they maintain cohesion. They stick together because they like the idea of what they're doing just about as much as they like their jobs. And the capacity to organize complex tasks. They have to put together complicated solutions to problems that keep emerging, especially in e-learning. And they have to be sort of collaborative in that. And here's the big one. This is the tough one, the ability to rise above self-interest. So in that network, for that task, and that job, and that, that, that innovation, they need to rise above themselves. So what are we finding from the research studies? Well, here's one. This was a high-capacity network. It had a very powerful center, and people who spoke all the languages of all the different faculties, engineering, arts, liberal sciences, they had a super central network. And it was kind of like a teaching and learning design center. But it's, it was the people that were so special. They spoke the languages of all the other faculties, and they spoke education without getting into pedagogy talk and, and all that. They didn't sound as much like educators as we usually hear. And that's why they were so successful. And they changed the way they actually purchase and deploy $100 million of equipment every year in three universities by using this model. It's decentralized. This was a low-capacity model. There was two groups of people that didn't agree on distance. <laughs> it was distance learning. Do distance or don't. They separate along those lines. The whole system weakened and got brittle. They wouldn't work together. Both systems suffered. Now they have minimum distance learning, and uh, they have enrollment problems as a university. Here, the worst lowest case was one sort of provost in the university saying, we will do this. And everyone tried to do what they could in their own jobs. But they were all connected only through very weak links to each other. And when there were problems in the system, and they had to come up with new programs or new markets, or, or in this case, a new a registration system where they had to share registration across jurisdictions, they couldn't do it. And the system just chugs along trying, trying to do new education. 
So how do you make them more self-organizing? We've talked about this guy. You, this is a real example. This was that network before the server failed. Remember, they didn't have the hearts. People weren't in it for the right reasons. They were told to work on it. They were assigned as a task force. The minute the servers failed, watch what happened. The leaders broke apart from each other. They lost their relationships with each other. There was no reason. They thought, well, we don't have to lead anything. The computers aren't working. The IT guys were freaking out in the background. They were really, they did make it work, actually. It came back up and worked perfectly within four hours, but that was it. The teachers had walked. We had lost their hearts. The instructor network was worse. They hadn't been too well connected to start with. They were while we were building the thing. They were good during the pilot, but after the failure, the technical failure, this is, they were left alone. And they stayed left alone, because that's the state they were used to. That's not the best kid situation. So we look at things as networks. I'm having some issues with this guy. We can, we can typify networks. There are ways. You can read the slides. There's ways to typify the networks. Here's another system. This system turned, we, we were supposed to study, this system has 8,000 families waiting to get into an 8,000 uh, student university system. They're private and they're, they've got a market you cannot believe. Five minutes? Oh, good. We've got a market you can't believe. They, uh, they are isolated into different faculties and schools. There's only one that's truly deeply innovative. The rest are kind of living alone. When the storm comes economically, and it came already in Alberta, the oil price fell, revenues fell, public revenue fell to the school systems, even private systems, and uh, these guys were in trouble, except for the star in the middle. They had a really powerful idea about language learning for the culture they were in, and they're still super subscribed, and they just changed what they're doing to the new economic framework, and they're actually growing. The rest is unable to grow. So that's just one quick example. If I go, that's how we, we're modeling these things now in 2D, but also in 3D. And I'm not sure, nope, can't make it rotate. That thing rotating in 3, that's how we analyze these things. So don't worry about it, that's all computer stuff. The emerging hypothesis after doing tons of these studies of my own and working with my colleagues at ACT around the world, we're finding that when given the freedom to organize a new system, we tend to organize it as a bureaucracy, because that's what we've grown up with. Yet intuitively, we know we'd like to run it as a family. Somewhere between the two are the principles for creating complex adaptive university systems that can change. And e-learning is the one that has to change the most and the fastest when we get into it. So how do, how do, how do we actually recognize the innovative things that are going to change everything we do? Well, things have to be shaking and in this equilibrium. Everyone can't be comfortable and happy and doing exactly what they've been doing and improving along the way. They have to be kind of a little bit disturbed, a little bit upset, a little bit like most education system I've ever heard of. Then there's this cusp of change. People realize what they're trying to do and what they can do are not the same. They're doing one thing, you're doing something over here with effective learning, but yet you want to be over here and you're not, there's this gap. And they can't figure out what the gap is. And if you do, if you, if you know you're going here, want to be here, but you are here, this distance to here is where the innovation comes in. I'll give you an example. That's the cusp of change. That's that deep, meaningful change Stephen was calling transformation. When you realize we have to do things differently. Most people go, oh, it's impossible. It's really not. And the way this happens is you get into, you figure out some deep innovation comes from an opportunity tension. Somebody somewhere says there's a chance we can do something differently here. I'm hearing that language from your minister. Amplification. So then once you figure out what it is that's new, the new product and process, then you have to figure out how to get it into the existing system. You don't change the system into these networks. It's just that, no, not going to work. But you want to make the existing systems have a new product and process. Mm. How do you do that? Well, you have to recombine everything. There are ways. It'll, that's back to the old business of recombination. Make the thing work for everybody in the system. It'll stabilize, and then it'll fade and change out. OK. Ah, a lot of theory here. The old methods of looking at change. Just, let's just look at two parts of it. S-curve on the left, linear, predictable. Disruptive, in, disruptive in, innovation model, Christensen, came in in 1997 and said, we'll change. I built my house, I wired it for Cat5 cable because I wanted to have my computer in every room. Overnight, wireless came in. All those cables are useless. The company that built them, underground, bankrupt. Things change quickly. Learners change too. 
Christensen wrote a book, Disrupting Class, where he says everyone's going to go to distance education like that when they get the chance because they can't stand the existing system or there's more flexible opportunities for them. My programs are an example. All senior leaders, very successful, wanting to keep their jobs, wanting to do a degree, wanting to learn to do research. They're doing it all because they can do it online. The designs have been evolving, but they're working. That's disruptive innovation. It's not predictable. And your markets will change very, very quickly. So when you do the MOOCs and the e-learning, your markets are going to change. So are your products. So attractions matter. How do you actually predict this, this crazy world of constant change, cusps of innovation? I'll give you an example. We always think success is linear, but it's not. You guys are looking at innovation as interplay between universities, among them, and among populations. That's very interesting. So we found in this network stuff that leader attractions work. And Dr. Hanley talked about attractors, but in this case, I'm saying, I'm showing you, you design the networks. You don't just use them as examples. And you also create the attractors. So that's leadership. What do you, how do you attract people to something? There's two kinds of attractors, shallow and deep. I'll show you what they are. A1, stable. This is make things better the way they are. Here we go, five minutes. We're just about done. Unstable is deep, deep innovation. I'll show you what that means. Status quo is a stable attractor. We're going to keep doing what we're doing better, capture more market, make more profit, have more happy students, and higher outputs, higher attainments. That's A1, attractor. We're, we think it's innovation, but it's like Stephen said, it's really just change. Then there's that deep attraction where the product and process of what we're doing is completely different. I'll give you an example. Uh, that's A2. So that there was a company in Chicago at the turn of the century that built buggy whips. The employees were all going out of get worried they'd lose their jobs because cars were coming in. They said, we're not going to be making buggy, buggy whips. We'll be unemployed. The leader said, no, you're going to make buggy whips. They said, no, we're going, to, we're going to try doing car seats. We had the tannery, the leather, everything will do that. They changed. They started making car seats. They're the biggest car seat and, and auto parts manufacturer to this day. They changed the product and the process of what they do because the people said there was, they were going here, but they, there was a tension. Same thing in education. Uh, I've given an example for Thailand, maybe. So you're attracted to something, but it's not perfect. A second attractor emerges. This is the one that we're teaching our doctoral leadership people in IT and in ed tech to see. See that experiment. Someone will be trying something to go from here to here. What is it? Is it eMOOCs? Is it, what is it? Is it distributed learning? If you can identify that, because it's going to change the product and process, you can adopt it, ramp it up, and you'll, your whole system will change overnight. I know several that have. So here's a different example. Offer online education versus, ver, with the best technologies and learning designs. Keep doing what we do in higher education. Or what if we could create a cyber university that reshapes lives in Southeast Asia and beyond? It can happen. It really can with the kind of thinking in this room. The tensions between doing the best with what we have with the e-learning and doing something different with some of the TCU affordances you're offered, that could be the innovation. Something in there could really change things. That's real innovation, the transformation, as Stephen called it. So what are some other attractors for Thailand? I've just listed a few there just for, your, just for you to consider. As you read your way down the list, you're seeing these things will change the product and process of how you come to e-learning. And I think you are leading the world in some of this thinking right now. I know every country I go to, they, they don't think they're leading. They think they're following. But there's certain sets of ideas that emerge every now and then. And, uh, and my board at AACT said, you know, they're doing something special over there. Pay attention. <laughs> so that's the other thing in these models. We don't design them for people. We build with you and with everyone. We learn as much from the, from the situation, the ecosystem, as tell it. And that's the new model for organization design. So higher markets, neighbors will come. Strategic technologies, you have them. High capacity distributed networks that are flexible and change out the actors, make you able to chase innovations when they do arise. Experimentation on the ground is going to lead. An R&D group in this wouldn't hurt to help you as you start to test these new innovations. And attractions matter. Change your, your purposes, products, and everything else 
for a very bright world. I'm just a little over. I'm sorry it's so long. It's time for lunch. Thank you for your time. If you want to get a hold of me, that's my email. And now, are we ready for lunch? Or? Oh, you're going to? OK. Oops. Thank you so very much uh, for your interesting and informative information. Uh, before you are leaving the Grand Hall, I have a few announcements to make. Uh, our lunch will be served in room 203 and uh, room 222 nearby the Grand Hall. So when you step outside, just look for the two rooms. Uh, you don't need to have any coupon, but you show the badge here and you will be allowed to have lunch. And uh, the concurrent session in the afternoon will start at 1.30 p.m. So 1.30 p.m. And don't forget before you leave uh, today's conference, there is the evaluation form in the program bulletin. So please fill uh, any information on the questionnaire here. And uh, enjoy the afternoon session and also your lunch. See you tomorrow.